So who likes driving in fog? <laughs> no, uh, me neither. So Friday morning when I was up, uh, I would say bright and early, but it wasn't bright at all, early. I took off about 6.20 for a Bible study that I'm in every Friday morning that's over on the East Loop. And it was some of the densest fog I can remember ever dropping through. It was it was soup, very thick. Um, I should have been familiar with where I was going. I go there every Friday morning, but everything was different. When you can't see beyond just a few feet ahead of you, it just feels like unknown territory. It's nerve wracking. I can only imagine, although it wasn't quite the same, how Abraham may have felt leaving for a place he didn't know when none of the landmarks were familiar to him. I wonder if all those landmarks actually kind of looked about the same, but he didn't have that sign like we find in the big department stores, you know, that has the big map and it says, you are here. And I need that because I need to know, actually all the time I need to know where I am. <clears throat> but you are here and then you can see the whole big scheme and where you're going. All Abraham could see was just the next few steps that God was leading him. I'm not sure how God led him, but somehow it was a process where he didn't really know the way. And I think if we put ourselves in that scenario and try to imagine how it felt, it will help us be more, oh, admiring of Abraham for what he actually agreed to do. And also a little gracious toward him when sometimes he didn't do it exactly right. How important was Abraham in the big story of God? Well, here's some statistics. Out of the whole 50 chapters in Genesis, Abraham's story takes up 14. That's somewhere between a third and a fourth. Um, he's brought up over 300 times in the Bible at large, and somewhere around 76 times the writers of the New Testament bring up Abraham. He's revered by the Jews, by the Muslims, and by us Christians as the father of our faith. So when God said that he was going to make Abraham's name great, he wasn't kidding. Uh, this week we looked at six major episodes in Abraham's life. <laughs> I really consolidated. I got it down to five divisions. Oh my goodness, five <laughs> divisions. Um, we are going to see Abraham at his best in some of these and at his not so best in others. So let's open up to Genesis 12 and look at Abraham's calling. <clears throat> I'm reading from uh, NIV. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I'll make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham left as the Lord had told him. It's remarkable. What was it that God had Abraham leave behind? What was in his rearview mirror? Well, it was a surprisingly sophisticated and cultured city that he left behind originally, Ur of the Chaldees. Um, Ur was known for beautiful two-story stone houses with 13 or 14 rooms. I mean, that's pretty lavish even by today's standards. They had hot and cold running water, great libraries, and there was cosmopolitan trade from all around the world bringing every beautiful and wonderful thing there was from anywhere. <clears throat> God called Abram away from all that, away from everything that had been comfortable to him, that had been familiar to him. He was never going to live in another stone house for the rest of his life. He would be on one long camping trip <laughs> for the rest of his life. Just tense. Uh, going to a land that God would show him. He had never been there. He didn't have a map, a great unknown. Um, maybe we can forgive him for not making a complete break of it right away. 
but he was leaving his entire country. He was leaving almost everybody he'd ever known who ever knew him. There would be nobody except maybe Sarah who could remember the things that he remembered, who could tell him what he was like when he was a little boy. Um, anybody who could tell him the old stories again, just Lot and Sarah and his sheep and goats, his flocks for the rest of his life. But God was also calling Abraham away from something not so great, from a people steeped in idolatry. You know, I've thought ever since Kim gave that thought about how those records of genealogy got passed down through the generations, it occurred to me that Abram must have carried some of those records with him when he left. They must have gotten passed down to him through Shem, Noah's son, because how else would they exist? They had to be on the ark somewhere, and so he must have had those. But the place where he lived, even though they may have had some truth about the one true God, they were living in idolatry. What did God call Abraham to? Well, he called him to something brand new, a whole new life that he couldn't have even imagined, a new inheritance, uh, a true faith in the one true God. God's plan was through this man to reach the world in a whole new way, through a family that would become a nation that would be a nation of priests, God says in the Old Testament. That was the plan, a nation of priests, men who would represent God to men and men to God, the one true God. In Abraham, though, God was getting someone. He was picking someone who had no credentials at all to recommend him. His name meant father, but he didn't have any children. He was 75 years old and his wife was barren. But God set his love and graciousness on Abraham and he took responsibility for him. He talked with him. He promised that Abraham would be so identified with God that whoever blessed Abraham, it would be the same as blessing God. And if you cursed Abraham, that was going to be. God would take it as a curse to himself. And that was going to be the case all through the generations of men and women who would be Abraham's offspring. Um, Abraham's response at 75 years of age, which wasn't as old then as it is to us now, Abraham said yes. He said yes, wow. As Paul puts it in Romans 4.18, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. Another version says, Abraham believed in hope against hope. It just seemed too impossible, but Abraham hoped and he believed. He was fully persuaded, Paul says, that God had power to do what he had promised. Now Abraham's father has died in Haran, and he sets out for Canaan building altars. When he got there, I don't know if you noticed, in chapter 12, he traveled to Shechem, um, God, he built an altar there where the Lord appeared to him. He went on to Bethel. Uh, he built an altar to the Lord there and called on the name of the Lord. Interestingly, some of these places he goes are places where there were trees. The pagans in Canaan chose trees as sites of pagan worship. So God allows Abraham to go to these very places, but he is turning them into something else. He's taking places that had once been areas of pagan worship, and he is turning them into the worship of the one true God and calling on God's name step by step. Now, think as Moses is telling this story, because who's our original audience? It's those people in the Exodus coming out from Egypt. Think about their take, hearing this story for the first time. They're going back to this land, and they are hearing the story of how it got to be theirs in the first place. They're hearing names of places that had trickled down to them, but nobody in their whole entourage had been in Israel for 430 years. So how cool, it kind of gives me chills. Um, 
they too are following God without quite knowing. They're, they know they're going to Canaan. They just don't know how to get there. So God has given them a pillar of fire by night and um, a cloud by day. And they are just following, just like Abraham, progressively without a map. Principle, following God always means you can't stay where you were. Following God always means you can't stay where you were. Have you found that in your Christian life? That when you say yes to God, when you said yes that very first time, he led you to leave some things behind. And he was bringing you to something new. We can't stay where we were. And even in the Christian life, as we go through this life that he's unfolding day by day, week by week, year by year, we still can't stay where we were. He has new life experiences, new places for us, often hard places, but he's going to redeem those places for us. Um, personally, it touches me that God is so gracious about peeling Abraham's fingers off of leaving, you know, that you don't hear anything about it being a two-step process for Abraham, that he goes first to Haran, that he stays with his close family. And then when his father dies, you know, God peels his fingers off yet more. Um, I love that because in a sense, that's kind of my story. I didn't ever want to leave where I lived. I lived in the, what I call the South, that Florida, Georgia, Alabama area, North Carolina, South Carolina, that was all home to me. I didn't want to live in Texas for the rest of my life. But I, when I came to see that there were God's people here, I couldn't think of being anywhere else. God peeled my fingers off that life. I wanted to grip it and hold on to it, but he peeled my fingers off the way he did Abraham's. My parents both died, and I just lost my whole everything there. So I gave it a try, and here were God's people, and here I am all these years later. <laughs> it's been wonderful. We can trace Abraham's steps by the altars he left behind. God took care of me, and I'm thanking him here. God took care of me, and I'm thanking him here. Those altars were like a spiritual journal or a spiritual scrapbook to the max, and that can be our experience too. So application, from what other life did God call you? What was your other life before you came to know this one? What did you leave behind when you followed him? As he calls you further into this life that he has for you and sometimes taking you places you might not have chosen, um, what is he asking you to let go of today? Graciously helping you peel your fingers off of things. In the second section of this chapter, we see Abraham uh, not being so perfect. He goes down to Egypt. I love that the Bible does not try to whitewash these men and women that we would call heroes. They're just people, and they make mistakes. They gave in to fear. When God gave these people, these heroes, a test, they didn't always get through it perfectly. Sometimes they took things into their own hands. So Abraham's going to do that twice in our lessons this week. Um, in verses 10 to 20, there's a famine in the land, and that's frightening when you have a whole lot of herds who need water and people who work for you who need water and you need water and there's no water and the food's not growing. So Abraham it appears, did not consult God. He simply used his best thoughts and went down to Egypt. Now, going down to Egypt is almost always an illustration in Scripture of being outside the will of God. A time or two, God is in it. But most of the time, going down to Egypt is disobedience. When famine hits, Abraham panics and he tries to solve the problem in his own way. But do notice, even as you see him doing the wrong thing, the thing that he does not do, he doesn't 
turn around and go home to Ur or Haran. He is with God. He's put his hand to the plow. He's not leaving God. He's not leaving the plan in his mind, but he does go to Egypt. And he does lie. There's no way to varnish over that. He lies. Um, he wants to save himself and all, all who are with him. It's a mistake that he doesn't learn from. He's going to do this very same thing again. If you looked in Genesis 20, where we were looking at that part about calling Sarah his sister, you see, A, that Sarah is his sister. She's his half-sister. But also that the reason that comes out is because he's done the same thing again. He goes down to Egypt again in a famine. Um, it was okay in that culture to marry your sister or your half-sister, but it's not going to be under Moses because God makes laws, big time laws, against uh, incest. So at this time, Abraham looks at the situation. He sees how beautiful Sarah is. Imagine, she's 65, wow. Mm -hmm. And she's so beautiful that he, he comes up with this story and he gets caught in it. It's so embarrassing, it's mortifying, it's frightening for Sarah. She's taken into Pharaoh's house. Apparently nothing happened, but it could have. God stepped in and protected her. God caused illness to happen in Pharaoh's house. Pharaoh is upset, and he doesn't just invite them to leave. He sends them away, it says. In one sense, everybody's okay. In another sense, not okay. Because we never sin that there are not repercussions, and there are going to be repercussions of this one. There are two things they're taking back that are going to be a problem. So in verse 16, when Pharaoh did not know yet that Sarah was Abraham's wife, he gave Abraham sheep and cattle, donkeys, men servants, maid servants, and camels. So not only are all Abraham's holdings multiplying, he's also got one particular maid servant who's going back with them named Hagar. She's going to come back into the story. Principle. Here's a principle for when we get into a scary place and our first thought is, how can I solve this? What do I do? And we are tempted to do this knee-jerk reaction, a golden oldie. God's will won't take you where his grace can't keep you. It's so old, but it's so good. You've got to just keep remembering it. God's will won't take you where his grace can't keep you. God had taken Abraham to Canaan. He wasn't going to leave him. I know he wasn't going to leave him high and dry in that famine. But we'll never know what God's plan was because Abraham went with his instead. Abraham does show us, though, what to do when we mess up. And I just want to take you to chapter 13 to verse 3. When Abraham goes back into the land of Canaan, it says from the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. There Abraham called on the name of the Lord. That is a, a good principle for what to do when you have gotten off track. Go back to the last place you were before you got off track. Go back to that last place and get right with the Lord again. God will meet you there. New beginnings, that's what God specializes in. Um, Micah 7, 8, and 9 says, Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. So when we have created a darkness around us that our own mistakes put us in, go back to God and let him be your light. In chapters 13 and 14, both of these chapters are about Lot. Lot and Lot again. There's a lot of Lot in here. Chapter 13 gives us this beautiful peek into Abraham's heart concerning material possessions. Um, it gives a great warning to us as we see what material possessions have done to Lot's heart. It's not for nothing that in the New Testament we have this, this um, section in 1 Timothy 6, 10. The love of money 
is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. Paul calls it a temptation, a trap which plunges men into ruin and destruction. And Lot is like the poster child for those warnings. So what happens, they have accumulated so many flocks and herds that now the land that they've gone back to is having a little trouble uh, supporting all those animals. The the men who work for Lot and Abraham, the herdsmen, are quarreling with each other, and Abraham takes the initiative. Note that. Abraham, as a mature believer would, sees a problem in relationship, and he steps out to address it. New Testament says, if you've been the one who's in the wrong, you be the one to take the initiative and go to your brother. If he's been the one or she's been the one who's in the wrong, you take the initiative and go get that thing settled out. So Abraham goes. He's the peacemaker. He's the, the one who's going to see it made right. He's also the one who should have the first choice here on who gets the land. But gracious Abraham gives Lot the first choice, which is so amazing. Um. Lot, it says in verse 10, looked up, or in another version, he lifted up his eyes and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. Oh, there's one to try to get for yourself, Egypt. So he lifted up his eyes, he saw what he wanted, he looked, and he took it for himself. Who does that remind you of? Somebody early on in Genesis who looked and she thought and she took it for herself and consequences came after those choices. Um, first, he looked, then he pitched his tents near Sodom, it says. Then he took a wife from Sodom, and finally he's just going to flat out move into Sodom. So this is it. This is Lot's story. As for Abraham in verse 14, God says to Abraham, Hey, Abraham, you lift up your eyes, and everything you see, north, south, east, and west, that is yours from me. So God is giving back. He's restoring anything that, Lot, that Abraham might have thought he had lost perfect example of seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added. Abraham was doing it God's way, and God's blessing. In chapter 14, Lot continues to be an albatross around Abraham's neck. The backstory is that there are five kings who live around Abraham and Lot. Now, we think of kings in a different way. This one, the king of a country, is just the king of a city, like a little city king. These are little kings. But there are four big-time kings who are out there who want, they see what these little cities have, and they want it, they want to control it, they want tribute from them, and they kind of come in like the godfather. Hey, we'll take care of you if you give us this. And so that... They fought it, but then they gave into it for 12 years. At the end of the 12 years, these little cities go, we are not doing that anymore. And they decide to rebel. Problems. When the big kings come, run by the chief bully, Keter Leomer, they are one powerful bunch. And apparently, the devastation that they bring, I think of Sherman's army coming through the south and burning everything down and pillaging everything. Well, when these kings came through, they were destroying things. So much so that archaeologists in the 1900s discovered a swath coming from those cities of those four kings that just was total destruction. It just was still evident in the land. Now, they take the people, they take all the goods, including Lot. And you can just imagine Lot as he's leaving, being carried away. If anybody gets free, go find my uncle Abraham. <laughs> and that's exactly what this man does, who finds himself free. He goes to Abraham's doorstep, and this Abraham, the same guy who was the peacemaker a chapter ago, 
is now a courageous, prepared commander of an army. He is going after them. He is not going to take that line down that these people are being carried away, not on his watch. Abraham's prepared. He's determined. He's already formed an alliance with these three brothers. For so long when it talked about Abraham being at the Oaks of Mamre, I thought, I don't know what I thought Mamre was. I thought it was just a, an area. But Mamre was a person, and he had two brothers, and Abraham had allied with them. So they all go, think of what respect they had for Abraham, that these guys, these brothers, are going with him, with their men, and they're not going like to Lovekin to chase after these marauders. They are going hundreds of miles to chase them down, battle them, bring back the spoils, and bring back all the, the stolen people. Um, by the way, there are several firsts in this section. This is the first mention of war in the Bible. This is the first example of a term we use called kinsman redeemer, which means that someone in your family, when they realize you are in distress, they go and take care of you, go the extra mile to see that you're okay. Kinsman Redeemer pops up in the book of Ruth with Boaz becoming Ruth's kinsman redeemer. He sees that she's in need and he takes her in and marries her. But the greatest example of a kinsman redeemer is Jesus, who absolutely stops at nothing to take God's beloved people out of the clutches of the enemy, Satan. He goes to the cross as our kinsman redeemer. Um, this is also the first mention of this enigma that we know as Melchizedek. Melchizedek is talked about in the book of Hebrews, and there's not a lot of time to mention much about him, but he's a priest king of Salem. First time we've ever had the word priest mentioned in the Bible. Salem is later to be known as Jerusalem. Um, interesting that this, this fella from out in who knows where, he pops up out of nowhere, he knows the one true God. Amazing. Um, he comes to Abraham as Abraham is coming back weary and battle-worn. And what does he bring? He brings him bread and wine and words of encouragement, blessing from the one true God. Oh. Regardless of all the things that you might say or wonder about Melchizedek, I just find myself inspired by him and wanting to be a Melchizedek, don't you? To those people around you who are weary, oh, tired from the battles, and meet them with some practical things, something to eat, something to drink, words of encouragement. Yes, 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 yes. And in a tie back to chapter 13, at the end of this, we see that Abraham says, I'm not going to take anything when it's offered to him. I'm not going to take even a thread. I'm not going to take even the thong of a sandal. You give all the guys who went, you give them some food, you give them their share. As for me, Nothing, nothing. Only want what God has to give me. That was Abraham's thought. Um, I forgot to say about Abraham giving Melchizedek a tithe. What in the world? And how much would that have been? One tenth of everything he had? There's another thing that kind of links him to Christ. But somehow, in spite of this resounding victory, when we get to chapter 15 at the very beginning, we realize that Abraham must have been more shaken than we knew. Because at the beginning of chapter 15, God comes to him and he says, do not be afraid, Abram, which indicates that Abraham has been afraid. I'm your shield and your very great reward. Perhaps Abraham realized that now He's no longer in obscurity. Now he's no longer just this person nobody knows at the trees of memory. He's a rich guy, 
and he's got lots of servants and he's got a great army and he could have a big target on him. Maybe that was what he was thinking. And God says, not to worry. I am your shield. I am your great reward. I myself. Um, principle walking with the Lord will always involve laying down our rights for the sake of others. Walking with the Lord will always involve laying down our rights for the sake of others. It just can't be any other way. It just is that God will call you and he calls me to lay down things that would be a right. A right maybe not to be involved with somebody else's problem. A right to just, gosh, keep what's mine. Why should I share it? God will call us to lay down our rights for other people. Is there something you need to lay down? Maybe for your husband. Maybe for your family. Maybe for a friend. A place where to really love another person, you need to lay down something for them. Who sets the biggest example of that? Christ. Christ who laid down his life for us, how much less is anything that we would have to lay down. Um, Genesis 15, cutting a covenant. Cutting is literally what it was, and Kim talked about that last week, so I don't feel the need to say very much about it except to highlight this one verse. 15, 6, Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. At this point, Abraham had been wondering about some things. Am I really going to have all this land? Is it really going to be mine? Am I really going to have a son? Will there be offspring? Should I think about my servant in, instead of having a son of my own? But God says, no, count the stars if you can count them. Your descendants are going to be as numberless as those stars are for you to count. And Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. What a verse. What an important verse. Maybe the most important verse almost of the New Testament, that we believe God, that when we are told that Christ died for our sins, that there is no payment that we can bring, that that is the flat out truth. Abraham couldn't do anything here. God walked through those cut animals. Abraham's out cold. He couldn't do anything. We can't do anything to add to our salvation. The principle, the only thing necessary to activate God's promises is faith. And even that is a gift. The only thing necessary to activate God's promises is faith. And even that is a gift because we can't drum it up in ourselves. We wouldn't even seek God if he didn't jiggle our willers to will him. Um, one small thing in there is just this foretelling that God gives Abraham all those years ago that his people, his descendants, would be enslaved by a nation, but they'd come out with great possessions that they'd be enslaved for 400 years and gosh imagine Moses audience ears perking up at that why that's exactly what happened 430 years it happened just the way God told our ancestor Abraham and the last segment is this segment on Hagar Abraham and Sarah once again try to take things into their own hands you can kind of understand it it hasn't happened yet. I mean, how many times have you done that? I've done it. Nothing's happening. God hasn't worked. I've been waiting. How about if I just... And so they hatch this plan, a terrible plan. And then it just all blows up. And off is Hagar, run away. Run away from her mistress, alone, scared, frightened, far from Egypt. How's she going to get home? How's she going to get anywhere? There is nobody who cares about Hagar. There's nobody looking out after Hagar. Who even from Abraham's settlement is going to come after Hagar? Only one 
person in the entire universe cares about Hagar. It is God. And he sends the angel of the Lord to meet her there at that spring and engage her. Where have you come from? Where are you going? Talk to me here. Let's talk. Abraham shares her story and the angel says, go back to your mistress and submit. And then this wonderful promise, I'll so increase your descendants that they'll be too numerous to count. You are now with child. You are going to have a son and you will name him Ishmael. You know, somehow I missed the meaning of Ishmael's name. I think I have never Remember that Ishmael means God hears. God hears. God heard Hagar. And he unfolded a hope and a future, even for Hagar, even for her son, who was going to be a wild donkey, who wasn't going to have the greatest, you know, everything, being against everybody, and his descendants still are. But there was a hope and a future. And I think, and Kim, you might know this. I think this is the first time anybody in the Bible has ever given God a name. I know Abraham's going to give God a name. But of all the people, to be the very first person to give God a name, and she calls him El Roy, the God who sees me. I have now seen the one who sees me. I have seen the one who sees me. I mean, she must have been beyond astounded at the goodness of God to see her. So she goes back and they must have believed her because they take the name that she gives, that God gave her. They take that name and name the boy Ishmael principle, there are no minor characters in the story of God. Makes me want to cry. Who was Hagar? The world would say she's a nobody. But there are no nobodies in the story of God. Every character sufferings, every person's sufferings, every person's choices matter to the King of Kings. Your situation today, your heartache, your fears, your worries, the things that keep you awake at night, oh, he hears, he sees, he cares. When Abraham said yes to God, he could never imagine all the twists and turns that life was going to hold for him. He couldn't see the future, not as he traveled to Canaan and not afterwards, except for the little pieces that God revealed to him. He couldn't see the future, but he trusted the one who held it. Exactly where we are today. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Would you? Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can trust you. What a good Gracious God. Oh, there's no putting it into adequate words. And Father, how we thank you that while we don't see or know the future, you do. You are holding it. You that we trust completely. You are holding it. Thank you, Father, for you say that in you all things. We'll work together for good. In Jesus' name, amen.